this video ends when I win the Champions League with Aston Villa. Several football fans are guilty of forgetting that Aston Villa became the fourth English side to lift club football's premier prize, winning the competition in 1982. Villa beat Bayern Munich 1-0 in Rotterdam, and now 41 years later, I'll be attempting to take them back to the top. Diving into the game, we know all about this Aston Villa team and how well they're currently doing in real life. For me, their strength is in their mobility, so we'll be rocking this 4-2-3-1 for this challenge and trying to use the space out wide to rip teams apart. Key players for us will be summer signing Musa Diaby, who is amazingly quick, so we will be using him on the right-hand side. And on the left, we will be running Jamaican international Leon Bailey, again to exploit his blistering pace. In Season 1, we will have four competitions on the schedule, and obviously we aren't in the Champions League just yet, so we will be gunning for that top four finish in the Premier League. Odds-wise, you can see how well Villa are doing in real life, because they're 50-1 to to win the Premier League title in-game, and predicted to finish down in eight. Kicking off our Season 1 recap, let's talk about our performance in the Premier League. We got off to a fantastic start this season, winning 10 of our first 13 games before having a rough time over the festive period in December. Much like in real life, Ollie Watkins was on fire this season and was our top goalscorer in the league, bagging 21 goals in 33 appearances. I also have to give a shout out to Lucas Digne, who managed to provide 14 Premier League assists from the left-back spot this season. Moving into 2024, the boys continue to be impressive, only suffering three defeats to close out the season. We did fire out a true statement of intent in our final six fixtures, scoring 19 goals in that time whilst not conceding a single goal, which is pretty darn impressive, including a 4-0 win away at Anfield. Those results saw us finish third in the Premier League with a total of 82 points, meaning we will be in the Champions League for next season, which is when this challenge starts for real. However, our domestic cup performance wasn't great as we lost on penalties to Brentford in the EFL Cup and in the quarterfinals of the FA Cup, to a strong Manchester City side. And as one of the teams with the biggest, if not the biggest budget in the Conference League, you would be expecting us to do really well in that competition this season. And of course, we got off to a great start. Initially, we had to qualify for the competition and dominated Croatian side Rijeka on the road to qualify for the group stages. The group was pretty straightforward as we were drawn alongside teams from Serbia, Greece and Ukraine and we topped the group with 16 points from our six fixtures to see us move into the knockout phases of the competition. First start was Sparta Prague in the round of 16 and we were on the road in the first leg. Sparta took the lead in this game through Jani Jutscha before we grew into the game and equalised through Oli Watkins. In the second half, we managed to take the lead with Callum Chambers nodding home from a Lucas Digne corner and then back at Villa Park we started like a house on fire bagging two goals inside the first 20 minutes with Ollie Watkins and Nicolo Zaniolo firing home. Then in the second half Callum Chambers was on hand yet again to head home from a Digne free kick to see us progress with a 5-1 win on aggregate. That saw us move into the quarterfinals, where we would take on Sturm Graz from Austria. We were on the road again in the first leg, and we were caught pretty cold here as Sturm Graz raced out to an initial quick two-goal lead. We did manage to get back into the game with goals from Jacob Ramsey and John McGinn, but Sturm Graz scored a third to take a single-goal lead into the second leg. However, here we did leave it late, but we managed to score three quick-fire goals in the final ten minutes to see us progress with a 5-3 aggregate win. That saw us move into the semi-finals where we would face Italian side Fiorentina, but this time the first leg would be at Villa Park. We gave away an early penalty that was converted by Nico Gonzalez, but we managed to pull level through Leon Bailey. In the second half, we started to turn the screw and added goals from Jacob Ramsey, and then Douglas Luiz fired home a penalty of our own to give us a 3-1 aggregate lead. In Italy, Fiorentina had to attack and we were able to pick them apart, scoring four goals with four different goal scorers to move into the final to take on Belgian side Genk. We got off to an absolute flyer in this one with John McGinn tapping in from close range inside the fourth minute. This was a super nervy game and the boys wasted several opportunities which allowed Genk to pull level with just 10 minutes remaining of the initial 90. This is how the game remained, forcing us into extra time, but the extra 30 couldn't separate us 
meaning we need penalties to decide the game. In the shoe tank, we saw Zaniola and Moreno miss penalties for us, but luckily we have penalty saving superstar Emi Martinez in goal as he saves three penalties during the shootout to see us crowned Europa Conference League champions. This was a good season all told, but now the challenge really begins as we'll be back in the Champions League for season number two. Over the summer, we have £47 million to spend in terms of our transfer budget, but several of our players are wanted men, so I might end up with a little bit more in the kitty to play with. Over the summer, we said goodbye to a couple of players as Morgan Sanson departed for a French side Nice for £3.4 million, and we also shipped off Lander Dendonka to Spanish side Alaves for £8.75 million, and Courtney Howes joined Sheffield United for £6.75 million. So all told, we made an additional 20 million over the summer. On the incoming side of things, we had the pre-arranged transfer of Omar Kadir from our affiliate club for 2.4 million pounds. And of course, we made some signings of our own as we welcome Wonderkid Rooney Baji to add to our plethora of amazing wide players from FC Copenhagen after hitting his minimum fee release clause of nine and a half million pounds. We then added another striker option as we signed Karim Konate from Red Bull Salzburg for 20 million. And finally added young defender Zeno Dibast from Andalect for an initial £25 million. With those additions, this is how our team looks going into Season 2, and I'm already loving the look of that young and dynamic front four. This season sees us return to the Champions League for the first time in the challenge, and we will of course be entering in the league phase. Domestically, we will be trying to improve on last season's third place finish, but the media aren't backing us as we're predicted to finish down in eighth yet again. We got off to a ropey start in season number two in the Premier League as the fixture computer really threw up a rough start, but after two points from our first three games, the team settled into a really nice rhythm and the wind started to roll in. Our star man this season was Musa Diaby who transitioned to playing exclusively on the left wing, chipping in with a whopping 33 goals and 16 assists in all competitions, which is a monster output for a winger. The best of the summer signings was Ivorian striker Karim Kanate, who took to the Premier League nicely, providing 10 goals in 20 league matches and finally claimed the starting spot towards the end of the season. So I'll be looking forward to seeing how he gets on leading the line next year. From January onwards, the team was really settled and were putting in dominant performances left, right and centre, but we still couldn't win the league. We finished second in the table with 88 points, but were still somehow five points behind Liverpool, who secured their second title in a row. Once we improved in the Premier League and we closed the gap at the top of the table, this season in the domestic cups is where we really excelled. In the EFL Cup, we moved through the early rounds, knocking out Sheffield United, Hull City and Chelsea to set up a two-legged semi-final against Leicester. The first leg was at Villa Park and we really took charge of the tie, firing five goals in without reply to basically put one foot in the EFL Cup final. That five goal lead enabled us to rotate in the second leg and we did sadly lose that one 1-0 but comfortably advanced to the final where we take on Newcastle. In that final we got off to a great start with Jacob Ramsey giving us the lead on the 19th minute but Newcastle quickly took the lead themselves with two goals inside three first half minutes. Lucas Digne then pulled us level in the second half but Newcastle regained that lead shortly after some sloppy defending from us allowed Kieran Trippier to make it 3-2. I thought the game was dead and buried, but in injury time, we were awarded a corner, and in the second phase of the set piece, Karim Kanate was able to score to send the game into extra time. Here, we really came into our own as we scored twice in the extra 30 minutes to take a 5-3 lead, only to see Newcastle score a goal of their own to leave me a bit twitchy going into the final few minutes, but we were able to hold on and win our second trophy of this save. And in the FA Cup, we made it all the way to the final, going on a fantastic run in the competition, dispatching Southampton, Brighton, Chelsea and Manchester City before demolishing Sheffield United at Wembley in the semi-final. This run set up a second final appearance for the season, and this time we take on Arsenal. Bukayo Saka gave the Gunners the lead in the first half in a game Arsenal dominated, but we somehow managed to pull ourselves level deep into injury time with a Douglas Luiz penalty. That sent the game into extra extra time yet again and this time we took the lead through substitute Emi Buendia but his strike was cancelled out by Saliba tapping home from close range after a good save from Martinez. So the game had to be settled by penalties but some of our takers had a horrible time of it as Leon Bailey, Bubakar Kamara and Paul Torres all saw their penalties saved by the Arsenal keeper 
to see Diego Simeone's man lift the FA Cup. And finally, we made our return to the Champions League where we continue to look very impressive in a cup competition, winning six of our eight league phase fixtures, including a 6-2 demolition of PSG at Villa Park. Those results saw us finish fourth in the table and automatically qualify for the round of 16 where we'd face Atletico Madrid. The first leg of this was away at the Metropolitano and we took the lead through Jacob Ramsey in the second half, but Atletico clapped back quickly with João Felix scoring a late brace to give them a 2-1 lead. However, back at Fortress Villa Park, we were a completely different animal, smashing in five goals without reply, all whilst restricting Atletico to just three shots off target. It was Juventus up next in the quarterfinals, and yet again we were phenomenal at home, firing another five goals in, with Karim Kanate scoring a very impressive hat-trick. Things didn't get much better for the old lady back in Turin as we came to play yet again and despite Vlahovic giving Juve the lead on the night, we scored another five goals to progress with a 10-1 aggregate victory. So we moved into the semi-finals where we had a huge test as we took on Real Madrid. The first leg was at the Bernabeu and we were taught a lesson by one of Europe's elite sides as Victor Osimhen scored a hat-trick in a 4-0 win to give us it all to do back at home. We had to attack in the second leg which really allowed Madrid to pick us off as Osimhen continued his impressive goal-scoring form, getting another two goals to see us lose the tie 6-1 on aggregate and see this challenge go on for another season at least. This year we've taken some huge strides forward and added another trophy to our trophy cabinet. Over the summer I'll be looking to improve our defence as it seems we're pretty good at scoring goals and we have just shy of £70 million so that will do nicely. Defensive reinforcements were required this summer, so my first signing was Japanese defender Kiroki Ito from Stuttgart, who joined us for 29.5 million. I thought we also needed a bit of that elite winning spirit, so we added Carl Walker to the team for just 5 million pounds. He is now 35 years old, but he still definitely has it at this level and returns back to Aston Villa for a second spell at the club. I also picked up young Brazilian defensive midfielder Andre from Fluminense for 13.75 million to bolster our midfield and Tim Ronning to add on our depth chart in the goalkeeper position, but I don't see him ousting Martinez at all. And finally, we added Tommy Doyle on a free transfer after his contract at Manchester City had come to an end. Key outgoings for us this summer were Emi Buendia, who went to join AC Milan for 28 and a half million and we said goodbye to Tyrone Mings who moved across to Wolves for 19.25 million. Going into the season this is how our best 11 looks with Kyle Walker the only summer signing making it into our best 11. However, our squad depth is at a level that we've never had before, so fingers crossed we can actually use that to our advantage and fight on several fronts this season. We're going to kick off the season review with the defence of our EFL Cup and we managed to win our opening fixtures, defeating Accrington Stanley and Norwich before taking on Arsenal in the quarterfinals. This game was at the Emirates and we managed to take the lead early through Douglas Luiz, but his strike was quickly cancelled out by Jakob Kior. However, you can now see how far this team has come because we were clearly the better team here, bagging additional goals through Karim Kanate and Oli Watkins to see us progress to the next round. Here we face Liverpool over two legs and managed to open up a slender lead in the first leg with Leon Bailey running the game, providing two goals in a 3-2 win. At Anfield, Bailey continued to dominate the fixture, adding another brace, but this time our defence stood firm, winning the tie 5-2 on aggregate. This set up our second EFL Cup final appearance in two seasons, and this year we would take on Chelsea. We took to the field knowing that again we were the better side and managed to open the scoring early with Levi Colwell casually passing the ball into his own net on the 12th minute. In the second half we continued to be on top and added a second through Moussa Diaby to see us lift our second EFL Cup in a row. And last season we lost in the final of the FA Cup and this year we managed to return thanks to a slightly favourable run. We managed to advance with victories against Bournemouth, Arsenal, Reading, Sheffield United and Coventry to set up a crunch final against Liverpool. Much the same as the EFL Cup fixtures, Leon Bailey was on form here as we battled back from two goals down to win the fixture at Wembley 4-2 and lift the club's first FA Cup for the first time since 1957. 
After missing out on the title by five points last season, we started our 2025-26 league campaign by going on a superb unbeaten run that spanned 20 fixtures until we lost to Liverpool in January. We didn't have one standout forward this season, but I do have to say that Jacob Ramsey is an absolute superstar, providing 16 goals and 9 assists from the central attacking midfield spot. That defeat to Liverpool saw us then falter in the league, only picking up one point from 15 on offer in January and February, before finally settling down into a bit more of a rhythm towards the end of the season. We somehow managed to win the Premier League title with just 77 points, pipping Manchester City to the title by just a single point. Now, I have to say this is a super low points return, but I'm going to have to take it, and we are crowned Premier League champions. But this video, this save, was all about winning the Champions League with Villa, and could we do it this year? We were pretty unspectacular in the league phase, only winning four of our eight games to see us finish as one of six teams on 15 points and 10th place in the table. That meant that we'd have a playoff fixture where we'd face AEK from Greece. The first leg of this tie was on the road and the tie was a complete mismatch from the start as goals from Jacob Ramsey and Yuri Tillemans saw us open up a nice and easy two-goal lead. Back at Villa Park, we continue to show the disparity here as we smashed AEK 5-2 on the night to see us march into the round of 16. This is where we would face our first huge test as we were drawn against Manchester United. Well, I thought this would be a tough test, but we hammered United at home here in our most comprehensive fixture of the tournament so far. With goals from Ramsey and Kanate, along with two goals from Moussa Diaby, saw us open up a very comfortable lead to take to Old Trafford. We extended the lead early in the second leg as John McGinn fired home from close range after a defensive mix-up. So we had a five-goal lead and United started to roar back with goals from Garnacho, Hoyland and Eriksson, but it was too little, too late from the Reds, and we moved into the quarterfinals. Here we faced another English side, and one that we faced a lot this season in Liverpool. The first leg was at Anfield, and we continued to look impressive, opening the scoring through Jacob Ramsey. Just after halftime, we doubled our lead through Karim Kanate, before Salah pulled a goal back for Liverpool from the penalty spot. At Villa Park, we bagged two quick fire goals on the hour mark as Diego Carlos and Karim Kanate scored to make it 4 1 on aggregate. Liverpool did then grow into this fixture with goals from Cody Gakpo before Alexis McAllister scored in the 95th minute. It was tight in the closing minutes, but we did manage to hold on to complete the trifecta of knocking Liverpool out of every single cup competition this season. Moving into the semi finals, we came up against Barcelona with the first leg to be played at the Nou Camp. Barca opened the scoring in this one as Clement Longley scored a lovely solo goal on the 7th minute. However, we weren't stunned on the big stage as Leon Bailey pulled us level just before half time. In the second half, we managed to create a few opportunities, but did manage to extend our lead through Alejandro Balde turning the ball into his own net before John McGinn added a third. We definitely didn't deserve this as we only had four shots on target and 39% possession, but Emi Martinez got a player of the match award and an 8.4 match rating, so I think he saved us here. Barca had to attack in the second leg and got their reward just before halftime as Ansu Fati turned home Pedri's long-range strike. Then, as we were about to enter into injury time, new gen Damon Thomas put the game beyond doubt to make it 4-2 on aggregate to see us move into the Champions League final. We took to the field in the final to take on PSG in our first real shot at completing this challenge, and we were all set to make history. We managed to catch PSG a bit cold in this one as Jacob Ramsey scored twice inside four first half minutes to see us put one hand on the trophy. After the break, PSG scored through who else but Kylian Mbappe, but as they pushed for an equaliser, we were awarded a penalty which Douglas Luiz expertly fired beyond Donnarumma. And that is how the game finished to see Villa lift a second Champions League trophy in their history and complete a remarkable quadruple. If you are a Villa fan and you want to carry this save on, the save files are over on my Patreon right now. They are linked in the description. It will be in the top comment as well. Head on over, take it on. And if you want to see me try a one club challenge, with your team give me the reason why down in that comment section and i will see if i can pick it up and try it for a video